So yeah, the plan today is really to, to finish off the jigsaw, so to take all of the, the, the bits that we've been looking at and, and, and finally put everything together and have a, have a working, uh, if small, uh, dependently typed language. So going to complete elaboration, we're going to look at conversion, we're going to look at unification. And uh, before I get into that, uh, it's while we're recording, unless O had edits this out, um, I just want to take this point, this, given this is the last lecture, just to say thanks very much to OHAT for managing to put all of this together under um, rather trickier than usual circumstances. So thanks very much for doing that. Um, right. Uh, there's an edit point if you do want to edit that one out. Uh, so, um, so today's lecture, we're going to talk about the conversion rule. We talked about the conversion rule. I mentioned the conversion rule yesterday as a, as a crucial point of... Um, uh, type checking, and and we had this uh, kind of check term function, which is traversing your raw imp, so your TTM programs, and when we get to the final point where we think we have the term, we'll call this check exp for check expected function, which is essentially applying this conversion rule. So today's lecture is pretty much entirely about how we implement this conversion rule in practice. So if you've got an X of type S um, and S converts with T, then you can also have an X of your X is also of type T. Um, also, yeah, to finish off, I've, I've collected a few a few papers and talks and, and, and websites that, that uh, I've either found useful in developing Idris 2, like directly useful in, in implementing Idris 2, or I've otherwise found um, kind of uh, educational and, and interesting. So, so uh, if you look at the last slide, then yeah, you'll find that. Okay, so this is what we're doing. We're we're checking a raw imp. We're we're, we're implementing check term, and um, just because this is the bit I rushed over yesterday. Uh, what is a glued? Um, so a glued. This is this is the the expected type is always going to be one of these glued terms, which is either a value like an nf, uh, or it's a, uh, or it's computed from a term. But glued gives us access to both of them. It gives us access to to the one that we happen to need. And if it's the one, that, if it's not the one that we constructed, and it will lazily compute it. Um, so values, uh, everything we do when we get into conversion, uh, conversion checking and unification, everything we do is going to be comparing values. So values are uh, represented as, or the representation is a head normal form uh, of a term. Um, so I've called the data type NF for normal form. This is actually, uh, so I mentioned this in the kind of preamble before we started the, the, the lecture that uh, something that's uh, been interesting looking at the Slack chat has been that uh, people have been suggesting maybe better names for things and refactorings of things and in, in, not only in the tiny Idris code base, but I know people have been looking at the full Idris code base. So if you're seeing things where the name, you think the name could be better or more helpful, uh, I absolutely welcome uh, contributions of, uh, of patches because I'm not a great person to kind of do this kind of refactoring because I know what I had in mind when I wrote it. And, and when I when I go back and look at it later, I can kind of figure out what I had in mind. Um, somebody else who, who has not been kind of closely involved in building this thing from the beginning might not have the same understanding of things as me. So if you have some suggestion for better names or better structuring of things, I absolutely welcome that if it makes it easier to understand. Because if it makes it easier to understand for you, it probably makes it easier to understand for others too. So anyway, just to say that NF can sometimes be a bit confusing because actually this is a head normal form. Um, so we're, we're, we're going to compute the, uh, the head, that is the constructor at the head or the binder at the head, and then the rest of the terms or the constructor's arguments, we'll just compute them as we need them. Uh, so we've got data constructors, type constructors, we've got binders, and the trickiest thing uh, that we're going to encounter a couple of times is, is binders, because um, with a binder, so this is going to be a, a lambda or a pi typically, so we've, we've got the, the binder structure itself, so this is going to give us the type of the binder most usefully. But the scope of the binder, rather than being something um, syntactic, is is in fact a, a semantic thing. That is, um, so given, given a... So if, if we need to continue calculating uh, something under a binder, then we'll say we need to give it the current status of the um, global definitions. We need to give it the argument to the binder. So that would be the thing that we're going to substitute into a lambda, for example. And that will give us back a computation of a, of a normal form. So as a side, you might wonder why this is in core. So um, 
normalization, uh, so evaluation and conversion checking, all of these things, um, slightly annoyingly, have to happen in core because of the way um, because of the way things are represented and the way names are loaded. So it's not strictly necessary in tiny address because we have a, a slightly simplified uh, representation of the context that is just a, a tree lookup. But in full address, for the sake of performance, uh, we're often loading things from disk. So we're loading um, representations of terms from disk from libraries. Um, and they're represented as a binary encoded form. And decoding those names can be quite expensive because you're taking something that is essentially a gigantic integer, so just a kind of blob of an unprocessed blob of binary data. And um, just working through that uh, byte by byte and constructing the term representation of a function. And quite often when, you, when one file imports a library, uh, it's only going to use one or two things from the library. So we'd rather only do that binary processing when we actually first look it up. And if we never look it up, um, we never do the process. So the reason it has to be in core is because it's completely possible, and it's, it's likely, in fact, that during evaluation, this, um, th these definitions that are backed by an IHO array uh, are going to get uh, altered. They're going to get read. Uh, and they're going to get they're going to get uh, read and written to. So um, the core is just to say that it, it's it's kind of flagging that this sort of um, funny business might be happening. Um, it's kind of annoying. As, as a result, it means that uh, uh, a huge amount of of of, of the uh, internal representation has to has to be done in this this I/O world, which you know I find a little bit ugly. But then. Uh, Real, real programming often turns out to be ugly than, uglier than the idealized versions we like to present. So I've, I've left it as the ugly version. So if you're wondering why you see core everywhere, that's typically why. Um, now, yeah, most of the time when we're doing, uh, when, we're doing uh, when we're succeeding in unification, we're going to be kind of decomposing unification problems by saying, uh, let's say we're, comp say we're unifying two constructor forms, and we can decompose that problem by saying we can solve this problem if we can unify all of the arguments. Sometimes, on the other hand, we, we'll get stuck. So if we're unifying two applications where there's some meta variables inside those applications, it might be that we're stuck. And that's that's what NAP is, is, is referring to. So NAP is a is a stuck evaluation. So this head, the thing at the head of a of a stuck this is an this is an unreducible function at the head of a, uh, an application. So it's still applied to some uh, as yet unevaluated arguments. And this thing at the head, it's either going to be a reference to a local variable. So this is using the uh, is of our structure that uh, certainly if you've done uh, the lecture two exercises, you'll be very familiar with by now. So it's either a local variable, it's a global reference, or it's a meta variable. And we're going to see what happens with meta variables uh, shortly. And the other thing we need to uh, deal with is closures. So closures are, um, are unevaluated terms. So, so things where um, so we started with a term. We're trying to evaluate a term. We've got to a point. We've got to a point during evaluation where uh, we're just pausing. We're, we're going to say we'll 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 get to this later if we need to evaluate it. So if we need to evaluate it later, we have to record what the status of all of the, what the uh, local environment was at the point where um, where we stopped evaluating it, so that we can resume. So it's a, it's a thunk basically. So we can we can resume evaluating this thunk by saying, well, this is what the local variables were referring to. So um, this would be um, in the case of full address, this would be things that you've got under lead binders uh, in particular, uh, uh, or, or things. If you're applying a lambda to an argument, it would be the, the values uh, associated with that lambda. Um, it, it will be the 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 free variables. So when when you call the normalization, you will have the current environment. So they are the free variables under which you're normalizing. And then we have the term, which is um, the free variables we started with and the binder we've got under, and it's a closure in, in that environment. So so looking at the, the 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 indices here, it's 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 explicit what the environment we started in was, and then what the environment we've gone under has become. So. Um, so that turned out to be quite handy when, when implementing uh, the evaluator. So from now on, we're just going to think of closure as a thing that we can we can continue evaluating if we need to. 
Right. So um, what we need to implement in order to have the, uh, the, the elaborator work at all is this convert interface. So the convert interface is the thing that implements the conversion rule. So I only gave um, the, the kind of headline yesterday, the, the convert function that says, uh, I will try to convert two things and I'll return whether it succeeded or not. And okay, this is this is core because normalization has to happen in core. It's actually a little bit more to it because um, we find during um, during conversion checking that sometimes we need to generate fresh names. So if we're, uh, we're if we're converting or checking for conversion under binders, for example, we want to say we, we want to invent a new like a new free variable to say that uh, is the scope of this binder the same uh, for any free variable that we generate. So we need a name supply. So it's another reason for being in core, I suppose. Well, we don't, we wouldn't need to be in core for that, for the name supply, but it, it is handy because it's, it's, it's nice and efficient. So actually, we're going to implement uh, this conv gen, so where gen means I can generate, I'm, I'm able to generate a, a free variable name when I need to. So conversion with a name supply. Uh, so that's implemented for values, terms, and closures, um, and the details are going to be done in terms of um, values, NF. Um, right. So, just as a reminder, this is this is where we got to with um, elaboration. With the, the, the at the at the end of elaborating each uh, syntactic form, we're going to say we've got a term. So, just as a thing that came up on the Slack, this exp, um, this is um, this is me being a, a bad programmer again and abbreviating a name unnecessarily. Exp is short for expected. So, check that the the, the type we've got is the same as the type that was expected. Maybe it should even be um, check conversion. Maybe it should be like, explicit. That that's what the point of this function is. So we've got the term we've built. We've got the um, type that we synthesized for it. And we've got the type that we expected for it. And we're going to check that uh, the type we've got and the types that they did uh, are convertible. So I didn't show how that works, though. I just said that this is a thing. So how that works is. Um, if the ex if there isn't an expected type, then we've won. So we've, we, there's nothing to check it against. The thing we synthesized is fine. If there is an expected type, that's where we apply the, the conversion check. So um, partly I put this up because uh, there's a little bit of uh, Idris syntax that uh, that I find very useful, and I wish. I wish Haskell would have it. And I, I, I wish more languages would steal it. I think Angular has something similar. So this is a this thing you see here where, where we call convert and, and uh, pat, we, we, do, we do a pattern matching bind. I, um, Haskell would call this an irrefutable pattern. So it's, it's a pattern that has to match when we return convert, which we turn from convert. So convert has to return true, and then we carry along the happy path. The thing that we've added is this kind of exceptional case, this, this, this pattern matching alternative or this, this bind alternative. So this allows you to. Um, program to a happy path, but uh, with irrefutable patterns, or well, what used to be irrefutable patterns, but also have the alternatives for your kind of exit routes if things go wrong. So the happy path is convert just succeeds. And if it succeeds, um, then we'll return the term with its expected type. And if it doesn't succeed, uh, we'll throw an error. Uh, and the second thing I should flag here is this, this bang notation. So um, this is uh, this is really a way of, of of making do notation a bit more concise, and not having to not having to bind your intermediate values in this kind of uh, converting to ANF by hand sort of thing that uh, that you do with do notation. So there are other ways to do that. So there's you know there's various operators you could use to do that. The thing the the reason I tend to prefer using bang is just that it's the same everywhere, and it removes that that load of thinking of oh, what function is the right one to call here, when really all I want to be thinking about is this expression does something. So get NF, that, that, that's in core. That's an expression in core. And it gets the normal form by doing some evaluation. And I just I don't really want to have to think much more about it than that. So so this bang in this bang in practice is um, it's it's it, oops, I didn't need to press the button there. Uh, this bang is um, is is lifting out the get nf as a as a expression in do notation. So there's a question. 
Yes. So you in, in the case where you where you're doing type checking, so when you really have an expected type, you're returning the expected type and not the inferred type. Uh, can um, you say anything about what the effect of going this way or that way would be? Uh, it, it would be about what is presented to the user because if they convert, then they're the same and for all reasonable purposes. So um, the reason um, when you, you could put either got or exp here and it's and it's fine, it would be fine. Uh, I think if I remember rightly, the reason for putting exp over got is that this way you get what the user wrote typically. So the user is writing a, the programmer has a top level type. That's the expected type. Whereas got might be something that's synthesized, so the names might be different. It might have normalized it a little bit more. So this just prioritizes um, what was fed in, and that's typically from the user. So I mean, you could uh, I'd actually suggest experimenting with this. Just you know, maybe maybe um, uh, write a program and make a deliberate mistake, and then change the compiler to return got rather than exp here and see if it has any effect. Just sort of play around with it. Um, it's 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 going to be a result of experimentation. I found I've got better results, but you know you're you're right that that's uh, <laughs> that that's going to have an effect on on how things look. Um, okay, so uh, just to be explicitly say when we check conversion, we're checking on values, not terms. So um, the conversion rule for terms is just turn it into a normal form. The conversion rule for closures is turn the closure. You know, you evaluate that closure enough more that we can that we can start doing conversion checking. Uh, there's one question. I'm not going to answer this question. I'm just going to put the question in your mind. Uh, maybe there's some optimizations possible here. So maybe, for example, we can convert some terms without doing normalization first. Maybe the terms are in in some kind of form where we can do a fast approximate check, um, and maybe um, maybe changing the representation of values might help us to do um, a better approximate check. So just to put that in your mind that there's definitely uh, optimization opportunities here um, if, you, uh, if you start looking. Um, <clears throat> right, so um, let's see how conversion works just quickly because um, there's not actually a lot to it. It's, it's um, once we have our representation of values, and as long as we have an evaluator that is able to produce those values, and as I say, the, the evaluator is, um, I think I mentioned this yesterday, uh, the evaluator is fairly standard. Um, it's, it's not tremendously clever. It's not doing any um, kind of, not, not, not doing many tricks. Therefore, it's not necessarily uh, the most efficient. So, uh, but it is fairly standard. And uh, the advantage of it that way is that I'm pretty confident that it works. It, um, so uh, you know, it has to do things like um, you know, when it encounters a, a case tree, it has to look at the constructor form, that, that kind of thing. It has to check whether uh, applications get stuck against case trees, that sort of thing. But um, but otherwise, it's it's a fairly standard kind of normalization by evaluation type uh, evaluator. Um, so once we have the values, and this is this is what you're going to be working with throughout the system. Every any any time you want to do any kind of manipulation on um, on terms that have been checked uh, throughout the system, you typically want to be working with values rather than uh, the the syntactic terms. So so knowing what those values are, where they come from, is useful. It's what we're doing in the conversion check. So let's say we're converting, uh, we're checking whether two terms convert, and we have a case for two constructor forms. So does this constructor name args uh, convert with name prime args prime? Well, it converts if they're the same, con if they're the same constructor and all of the arguments convert. Uh, otherwise, we stop. So this is where there's uh, a small benefit to uh, using values rather than terms, or to, um, yeah, to, to, to uh, yeah, using values rather than terms where we only evaluate as much as we need in order to do the check. Because um, if this check, you know, checking that the constructors are the same, if this fails, we will never bother evaluating the arguments. So whereas if we, this is what Idris Wan did, Idris Wan would, uh, would, would uh, compile to normal form uh, for, 
or would evaluate a normal form for checking conversion. And it could be that um, that you've got things that, that don't convert and you would have known very quickly without evaluating um, if you'd only checked. So, so yeah, we, uh, and, and what this all kind of does, all it's doing is like you've got this, um, we can convert closures. So all it's doing is uh, going through the corresponding pairs in these lists. Uh, so if you get to a point where there's no corresponding pairs, then they, they don't convert. Um, if you get to a point where either pair doesn't match up, they don't convert. So generally, it's structural, um, and there's there's only a few cases. It's um, it's pretty it's pretty short because we've got the evaluator. We're just looking at the values. Um, the most interesting case is if we're doing conversion checking on binders, and this is a this is a thing that you have to think about pretty much all the time when you're doing a, a traversal of um, uh, of values. So you have to think about what happens under the binder. Um, so remember that what is an N bind? So remember it's it's a semantic representation of how to evaluate the scope of the binder. So we've got um, we've got our name, we've got our binder, and we've got this function. So this function is is uh, the scope of the binder. So before we uh, like we we can do conversion of the binder. So this con binders all this does is lift conversion up to uh, lift conversion to the level of uh, binders. So it's it's just conversion. So it's just it's just checking that the types convert. Um, but then what do we do with the scope? Um, so we, 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 we need to come up with something. So this scope is um, uh, in, in order to, to have a concrete value rather than a function, we're going to need to come up with something to feed into that scope. So it, it, it takes a um, uh, so this this um, this is a function that takes the definitions and some closure that represents the as yet unevaluated argument. So you know, I'll, I'll leave a hole for the moment. We'll we'll evaluate the two scopes with the argument that we've just made up, um, and then we'll check that uh, that the resulting thing converts. But the question is, what on earth are we going to put here? Uh, and the answer is, um, I mean, it, it does matter what we put here because it needs to be something that uh, that doesn't affect the evaluation any further. So we can't just make up some concrete value, and and we can't necessarily just make up a variable name because if we use a variable name that um, that has been used elsewhere again that could screw up uh, um, the evaluation of the scope so what we do is invent a new free variable so um, this gen name gives us a fresh name uh, the conv is just a label that um, it's it's largely for for the purposes of debugging so that uh, you know if, if i see something funny in the logs um, and I don't know what's I don't know what's going on, but I see the name I see the name conv is showing up in the log. So I, I see a name that's generated from that in the logs. It gives me a hint that it's uh, conversion checking that has the problem. But that's all we're doing here is gen generating a fresh variable name. Uh, we'll make a closure. So you've seen make closure. It just takes the local environment that the environment we're working in and some term. So the the, the term that we're gonna we're gonna put in is this new variable, and it. Doesn't that, that's not going to affect the computation. Any time we encounter that variable during the computation, um, we're just going to be stuck. So, so if we check the, uh, the, the the two scopes are equal with our made up free variable um, uh, plugged in, and they're equal, then the whole thing is equal. Uh, that's basically all there is to conversion. It's other than that, it's a uh, um, it's pretty much the same as writing an equality operator, like like, the, like an eek instance on um, on terms would be. It's just uh, structurally checking that things correspond, and if ever they don't, you say, well, "Stop! I give up. Uh, return false," and only evaluating as much as you need in order to find that out. So. Um, what we really like to do, though, so conversion just checks that things are um, things are. Um, once, once they're down to some normal form, they're syntactically corresponding. But what we'd really like to do is have um, type checking in the presence of uh, meta variables. So meta variables are things where we don't know yet what their value is, but if we if we type check a bit more, if we make a bit more process progress in elaboration, we might be able to 
generate some constraints that uh, that allow us to solve what a meta variable is. So basically, this is this is how we add some form of inference to the system. So when you have implicit arguments, we're going to infer values for those implicit arguments. We're going to achieve that by replacing our conversion check with a more sophisticated conversion check that will solve some of these meta variables that stand for things that are going to be inferred. So we do this by um, a slightly different uh, conversion, or a, slightly, a function that has the same form, same sort of structure as conversion, but just as, does a little bit more work. So this is uh, unification. So there is a little bit more information that we need, a little bit more state we need. So we need the, we need the context, just like conversion does. Um, but we also need to keep track of uh, all of the meta variables that we're still working with. We need to keep track of any constraints that we've generated in the process of unification. So this this use state uh, gives us a little bit more information to uh, that we can uh, update if we encounter something uh, a problem, um, or that we can we can look up constraints in if we want to check if we're able to make progress on those constraints. Uh, and the thing it returns so. Um, convert just said yes or no. Uh, unify, uh, unifying is, is a little bit more than that because, uh, okay, there's yes and no, but there's also, uh, it might have solved some variables on the way, it might have generated some constraints on the way. So uh, yes, uh, other, than, other than those two things, it's the same as convert. So, so unify results is, um, you can think of it as yes, no, or uh, yes, but. So, so yes is I have succeeded. Everything worked. Um, the, the the two types that you've given from now on should be considered the same. So it might be that there's meta variables in them, but as a result of unification, uh, the meta variables have been solved. The context has been updated, and like an exp in um, in check exp, we can treat them as the same thing because they will evaluate to the same thing. So my return no. So the way the way no works is is it throws an error. So it will it will throw uh, a can't unify error. So if if you see if you're writing an Idris program and you see a type mismatch, that's because unify has thrown um, an error. And then this yes but this is the most interesting one because it might be that that that, that when we're trying to unify two things, we 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 have two things that might turn out to be unifiable. Um, if we make a bit more progress, but for now we can't definitively say it's wrong. So um, I, if I was going to if I was going to explain unification fully, I think it would be an entire course to be honest. So I'm I, I'm, I'm just going to show you this by example, and I'm going to show you a couple of cases uh, that come up in the implementation. And I'll, I'll, in, in a moment, uh, at the end, I'll give you some pointers to to where you will uh, you will learn the details in full. But just to show you what I mean by yes, but this is the sort of thing that might uh, that might lead to a result. Yes, but so this is um, uh, so I, I, you, we had a similar example on Tuesday when I was when I was showing you the the possible representations of terms. So this is um, this is a representation of well typed terms in a simply typed lambda calculus where we have concrete values and the concrete value is of some type that that we'll know once we've interpreted, once we know the type of the whole expression. So, so a value, like it could be that this is a nat, for example. So this A would have to be tie nat in that case. So we might have an expression of this form, and I've got the implicit arguments for A and gam here. So X is a term in the empty context that has type nat. So val 94 should be a well-typed um, a well-typed uh, um, term in that language. So how does Idris go about checking that? So first thing is uh, we'll add the implicit arguments. So uh, gam meta and a meta, these are the two meta variables that are being introduced that we have to solve in order to check that this val is, is correct. And as we're checking that, we're going to encounter, um, like when we, when we, if we work left to right on the arguments, so <laughs> it actually it's different depending on whether you work right to left, whether you feed in the type or not. And there's, there's all sorts of um, kind of tricky things depending on the order that, that, you, that you approach uh, elaborating the thing. 
And any problem that you encounter with, like, if, if you have a if you have a unification problem that generates a constraint, you might be able to solve that by elaborating in the the arguments in the other order, but you've then just introduced a whole new set of problems. If if you have um, you know some if, if 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 you have some other expression where the constraints happen to be generated in a different order, so it must it shouldn't matter or it mustn't matter uh, at least as far as Idris is concerned which order you elaborate arguments in. Some ways you might generate constraints, some ways you might not. So in this case, if we go left to right, when we encounter this meta variable, and then you know, we'll, we've, we've encountered val, so we said, well, the type we're expecting for this argument, when we get to 94, the type we're expecting for this argument is going to be interp tie of a meta. So it's generating this first constraint. And uh, 94, let's just, um, I've, I've simplified this slightly. Let's, let's assume we know that 94 is a nat. So let's say I've written as S of 93. So we've generated this constraint that interp tie of a meta is a nat. Can we solve that immediately? Well, no, we can't. We're stuck here because interp tie, this is an n app in the uh, value syntax, and it's stuck because we don't have a result for a meta. So we can't give up at this point. We just say we'll file away that constraint for later. With any luck, something else will solve a meta for us. And at that point, we'll revisit this constraint and we might be able to finish off uh, the unification problem. So when we evaluate, when we elaborate the whole thing, so we know that the expected type, we fed in the expected type that it's a, it's a term uh, of type nat. So this term, this, this, this expression will initially come out with a term of query gam meta, query a meta. We unify that with term of um, empty list tynat. That will solve tynat for us because tynat, so when, when we have when we're checking that or when, when we're unifying um, two constructors, we can unify the arguments. Um, so solve with tynat. Then we can plug in tynat into here, and um, and we're good. So this is why we have to think about constraints. Constraints might get generated, and we can't just give up immediately. So. Um, <clears throat> we'll see how that fits into the state um, well, uh, properly in a moment. But just to revisit definitions from yesterday. So we saw the definitions that exist in our context. And, and I pointed at whole and guess. So they were there yesterday, but I, I didn't tell you much more about what they are. So a whole, that is a meta variable. So our, 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 um, this slide gam meta and a meta, when the elaborator encounters these, it's going to add them to the global context, and it's just going to give whole as a definition. And a guess, a guess is an ordinary definition in, in a lot of ways. So it's a term that um, it, it's essentially a meta variable applied to its current environment. So so that allows it to be a, um, maybe it's a, it's a yeah, it's, a, it's a, an abstraction over an environment and then a, meta, uh, a term in that environment. So this is, the, this is the value that it will have, assuming all of these constraints are satisfied. So um, once, all, once this list of constraints is down to the empty list, we can turn this guess into an ordinary definition, which is then something that we can evaluate. So this um, um, th this this sort of this is a unification or, or um, type checking in the presence of meta variables. We add holes and guesses as possible definition forms. Guesses have no computational force, so they won't reduce until all of the constraints are satisfied. Once all the constraints are satisfied, we promote this guess into a, a PN def. So the PN def is just an ordinary pattern matching definition. So um, if you want to know more of the details about this and basically where I got it from, uh, I got this from uh, Ulf Norell's thesis. And uh, there's, a, there's a shorter paper, uh, type checking in the presence of meta variables, which, which explains it in, um, um, in, in the context of a slightly simpler language. But it, it, it gives you the, the, the concept of, of, uh, of guesses and constraints. Um, so I find it a very clear presentation. So it's, it's kind of what Idris is doing uh, internally uh, with some embellishments. So the U state, um, the, the unification state, is therefore containing the names of these things. So it's, it's keeping track of the things that are not yet solved. Um, 
that's for two reasons. It's firstly so that if we get to the end of elaboration and some of them are still unsolved, we're going to have to report an error. So uh, if you've ever seen the unsolved whole error, that basically means it generated an implicit, but it didn't have enough information uh, to work out what its value was. Uh, the other reason we need uh, we, we we have that in use state is so that um, when we've made some progress, we can revisit the constraints that we haven't solved yet. So so we need to we need to we need to know what the guesses are in order to pull out the list of constraints that we need to retry. So it's a it's a got a global list of constraints that we can refer to by this this integer reference. I should probably use something more uh, more more illustrative than int, but you know underneath that int, it's it's a uh, a map of ints. Um, so uh, just how these holes and guesses uh, appear, um, we have a couple of helpers in the elaborator. So in the current environment, given some name for a hole, so if you type query hole, um, then this is what happens. It will it will create a new meta variable um, of, of a particular type, and it will give you back a term, which is basically that name applied to this environment. So meta variables are represented as uh, like any any implicit that you encounter is represented as a global uh, function. So it's appearing in the global context. Um, they never get substituted in during elaboration. So so your the the terms that come out of the elaboration will have applications of meta variables inside them. Uh, the reason we never substitute them in is because it preserves sharing. So it's it it. Um, it, I won't say it improves the performance of the elaborator. I will say it doesn't spoil the performance of the elaborator. It's kind of a it's kind of an unpessimization rather than optimization, um, if that's a real word, which it isn't. Um, so uh, so yeah, meta variables are in, introduced with new meta and new constant. This is when we uh, when we find that we've um, so we apply unification, but we get some constraints back. So we have to say, well, I can't. I can't use this term that I've just built yet. I can only use this term once the constraints are solved. So what we do then is we postpone um, uh, the, the result of that, uh, in, uh, of that bit of elaboration. Uh, we create a new constant and say the constant has the, 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 this, this creates a guess definition, basically. So the, the guess is constructed from this term in this environment with the given type. And it says once these constraints are satisfied, then you'll be able to use this uh, the, the constant that we've created with this value. But until then, it can't have any computational force because it might be that the constraints turn out to be unsatisfiable. So we'll see we'll see where these come up in the elaboration process um, in a moment. Um, yeah, I don't need to say much more about this. Uh, con constraints are. Uh, pairs of terms, or they might be lists of terms. So if, if this really will happen if if we're trying to um, um, if we're trying to unify two constructor forms, for example, and we get stuck when comparing the the argument lists. So we'll store them as a sequence. Otherwise, we'll just store them as one term. And it's it's convenient to have these separate rather than uh, just having a single. Almost all things turn up as a single constraint. That's why. Um, and the other bit of the machinery we need is this is solve constraints. So called solve constraints locks in the unification state and it has another go. So you can in principle, you can call this whenever you like. You could um, you could as you're elaborating, you could just build up a set of constraints. And once you've finished everything, you could call solve constraints and see if it can solve the constraints that it's generated on the way. Um, I've done quite a bit of um, uh, experimentation trying to figure out exactly when to call that, and and we don't do it just once right at the end. We do it we do it occasionally at at strategic points during elaboration, um, for which seems to give the best performance. Uh, I'll say more about that shortly. Anyway, there was a ping. Someone had a question. Yeah, question from the chat. What about pointer uh, indirection if you're not substituting? Are we not generating a lot of metals that end up being equated, and we have to follow? Uh, no, it's a, the corresponding value. I mean, it might, but um, the, there's there's a trade-off between um, having big solutions of meta variables with lots of sharing and having lots of pointer indirection. And in practice, what turns out to happen, 
So you know, this is this is something I've observed rather than anything else. Is that when you have lots of pointer in direction, it's things that where um, you're, you're interested in in storing what that result is, but you're never actually going to evaluate it. It tends to be something in an erased argument that you just just throw it away later on. Uh, so if if for example um, you might have a, a very deep vector where every um, argument is is a lot of successes and it's every, every time you go a bit deeper in the vector you have one fewer successor symbol so that's exactly a situation where you would have a big chain of pointers because you'd have successor of the next length and that's successor of the next length and uh, yeah in practice you just look at one at a time so if, uh, well, you either just look at one at a time or you never look at all so so it's not a big deal and it's it it's just by experimentation again this is a significantly better thing to do than the substitution because the substitution um, hugely breaks sharing. So this is a lesson I learned from uh, Andras Kovacs small TT system. And um, there's a lot of other lessons in there that I haven't learned yet, but this was the um, uh, this was the primary one I, I, I learned. Um, so I just got distracted there because uh, one of my living room light bulbs has just gone. So, so I'm, if I'm slightly dimmer, that's uh, that's why. Uh, thankfully, there's more than one. Um, <clears throat> uh, yeah, and, and th there's a little bit more to it still, in fact, because it, it turns out uh, that there are some, some heuristics that um, that I've used to decide when you might actually want to substitute uh, a meta variable in. And, and I probably shouldn't go into the details of that here, but uh, that there are some situations where it's unambiguously a good idea to substitute in. And it's typically when it's a, when it's a smaller uh, that when there's a smaller context, for example, so it just gives you less stuff to maintain. Um, yeah, that's uh, these details are are surprisingly important when it when it comes to performance. And you, uh, I, I found that however much I speculate about what's going to happen, or how, however much I try to reason about what's, happened, uh, there's no substitute for just trying it and seeing what happens on a on a collection of. Um, you know, I try it on a few uh, pathological cases. So in the in the test suite, you'll see things that are called tests that have the prefix perf for performance, and they are things where something has caused them to be extremely slow, and they ought to be instant. So so if you look at those and and, and try those out under under different uh, um, strategies for inlining meta variables, it's, it's interesting to see what happens. But I also try them out by you know type checking Idris itself because you know that's. That's, that's, that's the biggest system I've got in it. It's actually a, a, a helpful thing about self-hosting is that we, we immediately have a, a big a big-ish system to test these ideas on. So we see what happens on, on Idris itself. Um, OK, so is that another question coming? Yes, another question from the chat. In the unification problem, t tilde f question mark meta, you conclude that this term is stuck, but say f erased equals u, then surely we can conclude that x is you know, unifies with t. Is it not only if we are case splitting on a meta that we get stuck? We can't case split on a meta because because there's nothing to case split on. So so the, um, I didn't follow the reasoning there. So that, there might be something I've missed. But just remember that when we're um, doing when we're solving a unification problem, this is all we have to go on. We, we, we have got to a point where we're unifying interp tie of a meta with nat. And yes, there is additional reasoning we can do, but how do we do that additional reasoning? So can you repeat what that reasoning was? Just because I uh, um, I didn't follow it. Uh, I can read it again because I'm... Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you've lost it. Huh? No, no, it's here. Uh, in the equation problem, t is similar to f applied to meta. You conclude this term is stuck, but then you say f underscore equals u, then surely we can conclude that x unifies with t. Right. So you have to do another. We have you have to go a little bit further to work out. You, you have to apply another rule basically to to do that to to get to reach that conclusion. So you um, so you can't conclude it from this bit alone, and there are additional things that we know or we will know. So, for example, this second bullet point is a thing that we're going to know. Um, but we, we can't, I mean, we could look at the definition of interp tie, for example, 
Um, it, it might be that there's there are some properties of interpti that allow us to do some reasoning. We don't do that at the moment, but um, it might be that it might be that we could do that. Um, I think I, I can think of situations where it would be beneficial. So, um, but just, I think the, the important thing to remember from uh, it, it is is that we are just looking at that one equation and. There will be more information that we can get, but the process is to uh, collect additional knowledge by doing more unification problems. Um, okay, so we'll uh, continue. Um, so unify is a, it's a bit more complicated than conversion because we can't just um, structurally look at some terms. So I can't, for example, if I have um, some arbitrary f applied to a meta variable, and then that same f applied to zero. So if I've got f of x equals f of zero, I can't in general conclude that x equals zero. So this is where this is typically where unification problems get stuck, and it's sometimes a source of um, uh, confusion when when trying to um, when when you're trying out new ideas with 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 types. Is is that you see an error of the form, you know, can't unify f of x equals f of zero, and you think, but they're the same. Uh, and you just have to remember that that you you might know some, you might have some properties of f that uh, that you can figure out as a human, but the machine hasn't been able to figure out. So um, on the other hand, if 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 we're unifying uh, a constructor with a constructor, so if we're unifying successor of x with successor of zero, then we can conclude that uh, x equals zero because, um, you know, if you've got successor of x, um, oh, it's, uh, there's, there is the property that successor of x, if, if successor of x equals successor of y, then x equals y. So it's a property of constructors is that they are injective, uh, cancelable, so with the, the arguments must correspond. So the rule in our unification algorithm, I'm not, and I'm not going to go through the whole uh, unify um, because um, like looking at the code is better than anything I could I could explain for that. But I'm going to show you the like the key the key moments in it. Um, so just like with conversion, if we know that the tags are the same, then we are just going to go through the arguments and check that the arguments correspond. So this unify args. Um, it's corresponding to the all cons that we had earlier. It's just calling unify uh, rather than conversion. Uh, so you've got to be a little bit careful about scoping because uh, arguments that are later might depend on things that appear earlier. So, so there's a little bit of trickiness just to make sure that you're doing things in the right order. But essentially what it's doing is checking that the, uh, the, the list of arguments correspond. And if they don't, um, so if, if, if the tags are different, then there's no way we're ever going to succeed. So if, if we've got two different constructors, then we've lost. Uh, the answer is no, so we throw an error. So convert error is just a, um, it changes up as a couple of others. Like you've got to, you've got to make sure that these are in, in a form that is useful to the user. So it's a, it, it does a little bit of extra work. And that's packaged up in convert error. Um, so the most interesting case is if we have uh, if we're trying to unify an application with some other some other value so uh, there's various different ways you could you could write the code to do this um, the way I've done it is is to is to say um, just to work through work through the cases just go through all the cases of unifying one thing with another if we encounter a case where we're unifying an application of something with any other term then we'll uh, we'll invoke the unify app uh, function. So unify app says, right, I've uh, I've got a head that I'm stuck with. So I've, I've got an application of a head to these arguments, and that's where I've got stuck. Um, but ideally, I'd like it to equal. I'd like it to be unifiable with this value. And in general, there's there's two there's two things that might have happened here. It's either a blocked application of a function. So for example. Um, if we've got plus x zero being unified with zero, then um, so we've got the head is plus here. The arguments are x and zero. Um, and well, if, if x is a meta variable, we might be able to make progress here. So so in that case, we'll generate a constraint and, and we'll suspend the thing. But we can't we can't solve this immediately. We're, we're, we're basically stuck at this point. 
And the other case, which is the, the most useful case, this is the point where we've, we've actually won. So say we are unifying um, an application of the meta variable var. So var is applied to x here. This is an application. So it, we, remember, we, um, so I showed you in the representation of term, we have uh, meta variables as a meta variable applied to a, a spine, which is the environment that they were constructed in. So when we create a new meta variable, we always apply that meta variable to everything in the current environment. That way, when we solve the, uh, the meta variable, so, we might, so we're gonna, we're gonna hopefully solve that meta variable with some term where those variables are in scope. So we'll, we'll solve it with uh, a lambda bindings of that scope to the term. So there's a question. Yes, question from the chat. Uh, do we even need conversion as a separate function? Is it not the same as checking that unify returns? Yes. Um, we're going to, um, no, we don't. Um, oh, well, yes and no. Uh, so I'll come back to that. It's a good question. I'll, I'll come back to it, though. Um, I think there's a slightly better point to answer it, if that's OK. Um, uh, remind me if I don't answer it. Um, so um, uh, yes, so, so, if, so at this point, we could solve this. If we've got query var x being unified with x, we can solve var but with lambda x dot x, and then uh, we can make further progress. So that would be that would be successful. Unifying query var x with y that would not be successful because we have a local variable that's not in scope. So uh, what we typically do there is postpone because it might be that uh, further progress would. Uh, well, no, in that case it wouldn't work, would it? Um, yeah, let's not I'll, let's not distract myself with with uh, with that sort of detail. So yeah, uh, you'll either postpone if it if it turns out that this thing is this this thing is normalizable to something that doesn't use the variable, um, or or you would um, give up. Uh, okay, so we've got these two interesting cases, and the most interesting cases. It's um, I thought about this earlier. It's 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 too interesting to show all of the code on one slide, but I can I can sketch what has to happen. Um, and again, there's, 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 there's a lot more detail uh, on this if you look at, um, so I found uh, Adam Gundry's paper, uh, Adam Gundry and Conor McBride wrote a tutorial paper uh, on unification, which um, if you, it, it presents the rules and some Haskell code. Uh, and I found that extremely useful to, um, you know, if, if, I, if I encounter problems in my unification algorithm, I look at that to find out what I should be doing. Um, so so that's, that's where you get all of the details. But the sketch of it is, we need to check that the meta variable is applied to distinct variables. So this is the pattern conditions, the pattern unification, higher order pattern unification is the algorithm that we're implementing. It's basically because we won't be able to construct our um, application to the environment if they're not distinct variables. We need to make a lambda expression that says uh, what it's what it is solved by. So we need we need these to be distinct variables in order to be able to do that. If they are, We'll try to we'll try to instantiate n as you know, I've taken some liberties with notation here, but we'll try to update that definition to be that n is equal to that term. So it's only going to succeed if this has the right scope. Um, uh, this is one point where it's been extremely useful that we have the scope available in the type um, because it's a thing that I got very wrong a lot of times in Idris one, and uh, it's it's very hard to get it wrong in Idris two. Because the type is the type is keeping me right, so indexing by vars keeps us right there. And the other case, so this is this is why I postponed answering that question about convert. So the other case is, um, I don't know anything about the the, the argument. Um, I may not know anything about the term. On the other hand, if if this application happens to convert with this term, we don't need to go any further. We're not going to solve anything new. Um, if they happen to be um, if they happen to convert, we'll just say we've succeeded. And if they don't, we'll say, well, we might succeed later. So postpone is a function that generates the constraint. So one reason that um, it's useful to have convert around is that uh, we can we can defer to it uh, occasionally during unification. Uh, there's a couple of other places where it's useful to have it around. So for example, there is a recheck. So that, um, after you've finished elaboration, it, there, there is just a small checker, just a, like a kernel checker for the thing that has been constructed. And then, then you would use convert rather than unify. So it, it, it's a useful thing to have around, even if it's not strictly necessary for the implementation. 
Now, we're we're nearly at the end. We've 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 thankfully we've spent a lot of time talking about the machinery that we need, and the lovely thing is that because we constructed all of this machinery and because Unify has a very similar interface to conversion, just gives us a little bit more. There's a little bit more bookkeeping to do. We can pretty much drop in a new implementation of check exp, and we're done. Um, so we've got a little bit more, I say, a little bit more bookkeeping. So the, the only difference in the type from what you've seen earlier is we've added the unification state. Otherwise, everything is the same. We're we're we're, we're returning the the type that we've um, synthesized. And the difference in the implementation is instead of this returning true or false, it will return some result. The result contains the list of constraints that were generated in the process, and it also um, says whether it solved any holes or not. So if it's if it if there are no constraints as a result, um, then then we've won. And I found it has been this has been a good point to um, try solving any constraints. So if that unification if that unification process has solved some meta variables, it might be that we can make progress on some of the constraints that we were previously stuck on. So we'll do that as soon as um, as soon as it turns out to be a good idea. Um, it is actually is actually a little bit cleverer about this. So with the constraints, it records which meta variables it's blocked on. So um, if if the thing that you've solved um, doesn't appear in any of the things it's blocked on, then it won't bother trying again. That that turns out to be uh, um, so. Uh, uh, that that's a thing that <laughs> um, OHAD has been a very useful user. Uh, OHAD had um, uh, OHAD Frex system. It was taking about half an hour to type check back in January, and it takes about I don't know 15 seconds now. And, and one of the things that made it a lot faster, I mean, I didn't get it all the way down to 15 seconds. One of the things that made it a lot faster was being careful about when to retry solving constraints. So if there are constraints, then we, we're, we're stuck for the moment. So we make a new constant. So this is, um, so we'll say that, well, this, um, this term that we've, that we're trying to, this term that we think is the result, we're going to hide it behind, um, uh, a guess. We're going to put it inside a guess. And so this term is the guess for a solution um, under these constraints, and it will become the real solution once those constraints are solved. And this, this, the constant that we're returning is is uh, essentially an application of that of that guess. So this is where this is where we plug in the um, uh, the unification check, and it's where and and other than that, it, it's Everything else inside the elaborator is the same. So where we where we call check exp, we just call it as we did before, and that's implementing a, a different uh, variation um, on the conversion rule. One final thing. So where do these implicits even come from? So where where do we where do we get unification problems from? Why do we have this machinery at all? So this is where we add um, the implicit syntax. So so checking. Checking an implicit and underscore. So I've just given the the version where we're feeding in type. So if we already know the type of that implicit, then we say, okay, let's let's work out let let's get the type of that that we're expecting. Let's invent a new name for it. Let's create a new meta variable with the expected type, and that's it. We're done. So we are going to hope that this meta variable that we've created. Uh, or the, you know, the programmer will hope that the meta variable that's created will show up somewhere, say in a type, uh, where it is able to be solved by unification. So in, in that example earlier with the value, with the val a meta, meta um, so we're going to construct this meta variable. In that case, it will show up in the type when we convert it with the, or when we unify it with the expected type overall, that's when this meta variable gets solved. So that's basically all you have to do once you've got this machinery of unification is change your implementation of check expected, change your or add add a case for implicit that uh, introduces a new meta variable, and you know cross your fingers that this is going to get solved later on. So we're now at the um, we're essentially done, and we're at the 
we're at the draw the rest of the owl um, point of the uh, <laughs> if you don't know that one look it up uh, we're at that point of the um, of the implementation the rest is just details so you've got the you've got the you've got the core machinery you've got the core representation um, unification is is probably the most important part of this whole process um, because so so because you know that's um, that's where you're solving all of the all of the bits that you'd rather not have to write down. Um, but important as it is, it doesn't actually take all that much um, to set up the machinery to uh, to allow it to happen in in a way that uh, really helps us out. So uh, we, just by setting up this idea of uh, guesses, guarded definitions, um, and the ability to introduce meta variables where we don't know what we have then everything, fingers crossed, assuming you've implemented unification fully, everything should work out. Um, so, yeah, I'll say this about implicit arguments. So we, we didn't do implicit syntax for, um, like we, we just said we write down a unit, uh, the, the underscore and unify the result. Um, extending to implicit arguments is, is um, in principle, it's really simple. Uh, it gets a little bit more complicated when you have uh, auto implicit and when you have the ability to to plug in your own values for the implicit, but only a little bit more complicated. And actually, the complications that you'll see in Idris too are really heuristics about performance to help with uh, disambiguation. They're not they're not things that you need to think about in principle. So so what this does, or what you do if you have an implicit uh, argument is, as you're checking the application, look at the function's type. If there's an implicit argument, then you better create a meta variable for it um, and then carry on. So it's it's just doing this. It's doing this process um, if, if you look at the type and say, oh, we're expecting an implicit before we carry on. So in principle, that's, that's all there is to it. And then the last thing, uh, we have pa explicit pattern variable bindings, whereas Idris doesn't have that. So we've got, uh, we've got unbound implicit in the type. We've got pattern variables on the left-hand side. And there's various ways uh, that, that you might think about dealing with this. So you might have a you might have a different elaborator for left hand side, which would be a totally reasonable thing to do. Um, I've got the same evaluator uh, elaborator for everything with some different parameters plugged in, and that's just because we have um, unbound implicits in types, which it turns out you can do in exactly the same way as pattern variables on the left hand side. So we've added this bind var constructor. All that happens with that is when you encounter the name. You make a note of what it was, so you note the name and its expected type. Um, we create a different kind of meta variable for it, um, just for I mean it doesn't necessarily have to be. It's just to just so that we know which which other meta variables that we've created that stand for pattern variables. And then when we finished, um, we'll pat bind we'll pattern bind all of the names that we've noted and anything that depends on them. So it's um, so you know, if you if you if you've got a, dep a dependent type, which itself is indexed by a dependent type, then there might be more names that you need to bind. So you bind all the names and the names that depend on them, uh, and you're done. You're 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 at the you're now at the point where you have the the the, the core TT expression. There is something uh, slightly entertaining about this because when when we've got dependency ordering. You do need to sort the variables into dependency order. So if you've got, you know, x's is a is a vex n, and then you've got an environment depending on x's, then you better get your n and your x's in the right order. Um, and it might be that the initial order you came up with isn't the right one, or the, the order they appeared isn't the right one. So this involves a little bit of shuffling of uh, terms in a context, which involves manipulating your um, de Brown indices to get them correct. Uh, and there's no way I would try doing that. Without um, without some help from the system. In fact, what Idris wanted, I, I think we we just came up with with unique names and then did the sort based on the names and then substituted uh, and then resolved the names again. So it was kind of expensive. Um, whereas Idris too, there's a there's a swap function that um, where the types keep you right. Follows the same sort of pattern as you've seen with weaken and and all of those. Um, okay, so we're very much at the draw the rest of the owl stage now. Uh, I hope that's given you at least an idea of what's going on inside Idris. And, and, and it will, if nothing else, looking at tiny Idris will help you um, learn your way around the bigger system. 
Um, but maybe also give you some inspiration as, as to uh, some system that you might want to work on yourself. So if you're, for example, if you want to do, if, if you want to experiment with um, some front end, but you find uh, a new front end, but you find full address somewhat uh, daunting, you might just say, well, let's let's do the smallest language where this experiment works. So tiny address could be a, a way of approaching that. So, um, so it's a, Totally okay by me if you take tiny address and, and run with it in a totally different direction. So it's full. Um, yeah, I put up a few references here uh, just on a few things that I found useful. Probably something to look at um, uh, offline, but just they are there. So, right. Oh, and uh, I see I've overrun again. So <laughs> sorry about that. But um, I hope you enjoyed it anyway. Thank you very much for listening, and uh, I'll see you soon. Uh, well, thanks a lot, Edwin. Thanks a lot, uh, Ohad. And uh, although other lecturers may not be here, I'd like to thank all other lecturers as well. Thanks to our audience for being around. So I think it was a great success. Uh, it was a challenging time and a huge experiment in running SPLV online. Ohad did a great job. I don't think of any other people who could do it better than Ohad. So um, yeah, a huge clap from everyone I see. And that's a pretty good result. So I have a big announcement, and that's why I'm here, is that, uh, of course, we decided to run SPLV next year again. Um, and we don't know yet how we're going to run it, but we know what uh, kind of team is going to run it. It's going to be University of Glasgow. So please either physically come to Glasgow or join online. We're not quite sure yet how it's going to be run. That's why I'd like to invite you all to actually fill in the survey that Ohad published and let us know your thoughts about um, about this school, about your wishes for the future, whether online works better, whether physical works better, and so on. So please let us know our thoughts, and please come to SPV next year.